Welcome, everybody. I see quite a few coming on in. Again, we've uh, got quite an audience this morning from uh, domestically, as well as Europe, Mexico, Canada, Latin America. Uh, welcome. Glad you could join this, our 411th Executive Next Practice Forum, originating from the University of California, Irvine, Beal Applied Innovation. Again, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and get started here and we'll have people uh, join us as we go through this. We've got quite a robust um, agenda today. First of all, uh, welcome to 2020. This was us in uh, early March, uh, packed house here at the University of California, looking and examining the future of work. Well, we missed those times, but we've gone one better now in transitioning to virtual and hybrid events and glad you could join us. Again, my name is Scott Hamilton. I'm CEO of the Executive Next Practice Institute. Uh, we put on global forums, we offer strategic guidance, and we make C-suite connections for enterprise leaders across the world. And again, welcome. This is our number 411th such forum um, to the marketplace. Here's what we're doing today. This is gonna move very fast. Uh, and thank you to all our speakers, each one of whom could be a keynoter in their own right and carry this entire show, but they've been uh, gracious enough to get their punchlines down to eight minutes or less uh, to give us some insight, inspiration and prescriptions for success. So again, not a lot of fluff, all punchlines and prescriptions of what you can do. We felt like in going into this, you know what the issues are. You know what the problems are. You wake up every morning and they're right in your face and your phone. What we want to do today is try to get you some solutions about where we can all go based on these perspectives. So we're going to look at an economic forecast, uh, tax forecast, immigration forecast, and the implications of those. We're going to look at the localization of leadership in a work from home world and hybrid world. We're going to take a look at talent market strategies and what's happening in those arenas. Uh, we're going to look at technology transformation uh, with CARDIS and see what they're doing and what they recommend. Bottom line for today's session, and it's quite unique, is we're trying to stage you for how you can reframe your global organization for 2021 and beyond. In other words, you could take this information back to your leadership teams and say, this is what the trends look like. Here's what we potentially can do in terms of pivoting and moving forward in 2021. We've got a stellar lineup this morning. Again, each one of these people could lead an entire session by themselves. In fact, most do. Uh, so we're delighted to have their time. We're gonna be introducing them as we go forward. All of you, uh, the audience should have a bio on each one of these people. So we're not gonna spend a great deal of time in elaborate bios. You've got the document there. It's also available online uh, for you to take a look at. All right, Executive Next Practice Forum, north of 80,000 attendees over the years. Uh, our whole claim to fame is looking, first look at emerging trends. That is things you can't readily see or are new to the marketplace or haven't been widely talked about. For example, we talked about blockchain seven years ago before people were talking about it. Secondly, this is your connection with key C-suite leaders across the globe, not just HR, not just finance, but the entire C-suite are present on this viewing today. By design, we want you to collaborate across the entire C-suite and across industry functions, and that's even more critical in today's environment. Our intent today is to form what we call next practices, that is strategy processes, leadership, and operations that you can take forward that are unique to your organization, not somebody else's best practices or benchmarks, but what's relevant for your organization. Finally, this is how you can find us in the future, our event page. All right, next practices. What is it? It is those concepts that take you beyond the status quo. Again, that are unique to your organization, not somebody else's. It's based on your model, your value proposition, your markets, your customers, your employees. That's the combination that forms the practices that will differentiate you in the marketplace. Couple of quick commercials and then I'm gonna get off the stage here. First of all, join us for the uh, HRN Middle East Summit. That's next week. We have a special rate uh, for ENP attendees. It's only $10. This is a fantastic five day summit uh, that's being held in the Middle East, uh, but uh, broadcast internationally. Secondly, Jason Duncan will get into this in just a minute. Uh, we have an event next week on building your brand via virtual events. Uh, 
The following week, we talk about strategy in a virtual retreat standpoint, how you can uh, marshal your team together in a virtual strategic offsite to get fresh direction for 2021. And last but not least, we have reInvent HR. This is a very popular series uh, we run across the globe to look at how you can formulate a more improved HR value proposition. There on the docket, you see some of the top HR leaders in the world represented. All right, again, this panel today, the speakers and panel are, are really gonna do a deep dive with us on what's happening and how we can potentially can reframe, re-strategize for 2021. To make this entire event possible, we've been lucky enough to have folks like Cardus uh, who have stepped up uh, and supported this event. I know a lot of Cardus participants are here today and viewing this. Thank you, welcome. Um, our program lead out of New York, Intrepid Relocation, Sylvia Ehrlich, you'll hear from her later, has been instrumental with our New York team, including Susan Ginsburg of SRG Advisory, in putting these events together. So this is a quote-unquote New York broadcasted event, and I want to thank them for all their efforts in several months in pulling this together. Um, Fragment, of course, is our long-term partner, annual sponsor. I uh, want to thank Robert and his team for all the things they've done for us over the years. Tremendous firm. Thank you again. Our internal group that supported this, Next Work Strategy, and of course, our production manager, uh, Mellow Firm Media, Jason Duncan. Okay, where are we? Uh, well, it's been a wild, rocky ride since March uh, for all of us, um, and it's continuing. So it makes things a little cloudier. Uh, we're trying to see through the virtual fog, if you will, and what's going to happen. So as you go through today's session, please take notes, use your Q&A function on the screen so that we can answer all your questions. Here's the big picture. McKinsey survey, they've been surveying CEOs every month now since March. Here's the August report. Most customer buying behavior is changing dramatically. However, only CEO, only 21% of CEOs feel they have the expertise, resources, and commitment levels to pursue new growth in this kind of environment. We can hang on to existing customers, but we're having difficulty making inroads with new ones. Two thirds of CEOs believe this will be the most challenging point in their career, but three quarters of them believe that this crisis creates growth. And that's our opportunity here, the, the channel and pathway forward to growth in this marketplace. So what are our steps forward? Learning how to be more adaptive, adaptive, that is changing our core to meet shifting customer needs and behaviors, identifying where we can, uh, identifying new opportunity areas that will take us forward, reevaluating our portfolio to see how we've allocated things. Do we need to stop doing certain things? And then finally, building a foundation for post-crisis growth that will take us forward over the next five to 10 years. So let's get going. Again, use the Q&A function on the Zoom. It's at the top of your screen or bottom, depending on how you got it, got it configured. You can also chat with us privately. Uh, please use the Q&A feature throughout the entire event. We will get to all your questions. Um, again, we've sent you the speaker agenda and bios. Um, and this is Zoom. We can't see you if you're eating your lunch. So uh, sit back, uh, relax and enjoy the show. Now, I want to first start us off with Mark Venter. And Mark, I believe you're on. We may have you go live. Jason, uh, let's pick up Mark. If, if he's still having some connection problem, we'll move to Stephen. Jason, do you see, uh, have you picked up uh, Mark yet? Looks like Mark's having some connection trouble. We'll All right, let's. Let's, uh, we'll come back. This is uh, the beauty of technology. Let's move on to Stephen Krein. And uh, Stephen, we'll uh, have you come on and uh, introduce yourself and uh, we'll move forward. Stephen is president of uh, the Canadian uh, Employee Relocation Council. Uh, they have been a great partner. We invited Steve to come in because uh, Stephen and uh, his forums have just come off of an exciting international series just in the past couple of weeks. So wanted to hear the latest from what's happening with CERC. So Stephen, if you'll join us via video and audio, it'd be great. Thanks, Scott. Can you, um, my video, um, for some reason it was working and let's, uh, it was stopped. I, th 
anyway, we'll let uh, we'll let you figure that out in the background. Uh, hang on. There we go. There we now go. We're, now we're Good morning. Welcome. Hey. Good right. morning. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, uh, for the opportunity to share with you some of my reflections uh, on the last um, several months um, about talent mobility and um, and that environment. Um, so, sorry, I got dropped. I got dropped in here uh, a little quickly. So. Um, I'll share a quick recap of the past six months and what I believe we can expect in the several months and years ahead, including some of the major opportunities that I believe will require innovative and uh, new solutions to many of these new problems. But let me start with a quick overview of the Canadian Employee Relocation Council, or CERC, as we're most commonly known. We're a Canadian-based organization with a global lens. We were established in 2002. Our membership represents mobility services companies and most of Canada's largest firms, including many multinational organizations. In simple form, our mission is to advance global mobility through partnerships, research, education, and government relations. We work with several global organizations, such as the Global Forum for Migration and Development, WERC in the, in the United States, and EURA, the European Reloc Relocation Association in Advancing Global Mobility. We're funded entirely by our members and one of our major sources of revenue, as with many nonprofit organizations, is our annual conference. In April, when it was quite clear that an in-person event was not possible, we quickly pivoted to a virtual conference Mobility Reimagined, which uh, Scott just mentioned, we held uh, two weeks ago over a four half day period. We heard a lot during that conference about how companies managed to get through the crisis and how they are planning for the future. As I reflect on the past several months and the impact that the, the pandemic has had on the mobility industry, I would have to say that like many of you probably, the pandemic brought out the very best in people. We saw lots of innovative solutions. I heard so many stories about how service partners collaborated to solve complex problems through innovation and most importantly, through partnerships. And I believe it's partnerships that hold the key to the future. Some of those situations went from assisting expats that were stranded overseas to assisting returning expats to quarantine in Canada. There were challenges with property sales that could not proceed, finding personal protective equipment for staff and clients. The list is endless. During this time, health and safety of employees has been job one. One of the major challenges for employers was understanding where their people actually were. This is perhaps one of the major learnings that we'll take away from the pandemic. During those early days, um, the messages from policymakers were hard to ascertain and were often inconsistent. So we were making decisions that we really didn't know, you know whether the ground was was solid upon which we were making those decisions. It was difficult to obtain clear directives on travel restrictions and, and as a result, many companies were making decisions with access to limited information and not really knowing where their people were. During this time, we held many meetings with members and established a COVID information page on, this, on our website to help members access the latest and mo most accurate information. One member best described this to me as the hair on fire stage, and I'm sure many of us uh, feel that way. As we look forward, though, I believe there are several opportunities for the mobility industry and the professionals that work in this industry to bring forward innovative solutions. Let's face it, the new normal will not look like the old normal. We'll still have global mobility and relocations, but they will be very different than what we've known in the past. Many people are also observing that it's not very likely that we'll see a return to the volumes that we saw in the, in the most recent years. And the types of relocations will change significantly, in my view. 
That said, talent shortages that we are experiencing and have experienced to this point are not going away anytime soon. In fact, I think they're going to be exacerbated by the situation. They're very likely to intensify as the economic rebuild takes hold for many of those skills will be a part of that rebuild. Winston Churchill once said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I believe that the relocation industry um, is ready for the challenge. So let's try and take out the crystal ball and look at where the challenges and opportunities lie for global mobility. I envision five key things or themes um, in our industry, all of which will require greater adoption of technology. Technology is at, at, at the center of many of the, these things. So number one, talent management and mobility will be very much more aligned. Mobility will play a much more strategic role in talent acquisition and the deployment of human capital than in the past. When, jet, when global mobility was seen as a, as a transactional role, now I see that it will be an enabler uh, to the business and will play a, a significant role in the economic rebuild. Number two, duty of care. As I mentioned, health and safety of employees is and will continue to be job number one. Corporate clients will be designing policies that protect their employees with emergency supports, corporate transportation, housing, medical care, evacuation, et cetera, not just for employees, but also for their family members. And it will be critical that companies know where their employees are at all times. Supply us partners that can ensure duty of care of assignees will be in high demand, and I believe will gain market share. The third theme is compliance. Compliance, compliance, compliance. The complexities around immigration, work permits, and temporary entry of business visitors have been compounded by COVID. Governments, as we know, have closed borders to protect the, the domestic labor force, making it increasingly difficult for companies to access international talent. At the same time, governments are scrutinizing work arrangements of foreign nationals as a potential source of additional tax revenues. From our research, compliance is the second most cited challenge for employers after cost. The fourth theme I see is this new reality of work from anywhere. The genie is out of the bottle and talented people are looking for more amenable working arrangements. Companies that offer these opportunities will win the war for talent. Global mobility is the perfect home for work from anywhere policies, supports, and ensuring the organization remains on side with its compliance obligations. The fifth theme is diversity and inclusion. After COVID, this has perhaps been the focus of society globally these past several months. Younger generations are demanding and driving social change, and rightfully so. We know that COVID has spared no region on the earth, and that every person has been impacted in some degree. Empathy will be the key to the future. As leaders, we must lead with the head and the heart. Diversity and inclusion must be enshrined within global mobility, and it must transcend beyond the home country. In conclusion, I think this is an exciting time to be a part of the industry. And I do believe the mobility will play a key role in the rebuild of the global economy. Thank you, Scott, for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you this morning. Yeah, Stephen, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for jumping in. And uh, we were a little off sequence there, but uh, I think uh, this was really incredibly important for our audience to hear what was coming out of your recent forums. And if you can hang with us a few minutes, I know we're going to have some questions and we'll Absolutely. take some questions after Mark has a, a chance to talk. So again, thank you, Stephen. And we'll see, you in just a, we'll see you in just a few minutes here. Uh, it's now my pleasure to welcome Mark uh, Vittner uh, from Wells Fargo. And Mark, uh, we're going to put you up on screen here in just a moment. Um, And we'll have you start your video here, Mark. 
Um, you got your audio? There we go. Welcome, Mark. <laughs> gotcha. I'm usually better at the technology than this. I apologize. And thanks for being able to jump in there, Stephen. This was great. Uh, glad to have you join us. And uh, we were just really looking forward to your comments. Uh, again, from an economic forecast standpoint, and again, the audience has your bio, Mark, but I just want to reemphasize that Mark is uh, managing director and senior economist for Wells Fargo. Uh, he uh, writes for the company's monthly economic outlook report and a weekly economic financial commentary. And he provides regular updates on the housing markets, commercial real estate, regional economics, consumer spending, and issues impacting both large and small business. He's a member of the Blue Chip Economic Forecasting Council and the Western Blue Chip Forecast Panel. And he serves on the Joint Advisory Board of Economics for the Commonwealth of Virginia. I want to welcome uh, Mark to our, our show today. So Mark, we're looking for, as you know, eight to 10 minutes of your uh, perspectives on what's going on economically. And I think you've got some slides to share. Um, and uh, yes, I, I'm going to exit and let you roll with it. Welcome. Great. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen Excellent. and uh, hopefully I can pick that up fairly quick. Um, if I. Uh, uh, let's see. Share, share screen. There we go. Okay. All right. And I, I'm going to go through this fairly quick. But um, in terms of oh, let me here make it bigger. Sure. In, in terms of. Um, of, of the overall outlook, the uh, the economy experienced a sudden stop back in, in the in in the late winter, early spring, uh, as COVID uh, began to cause shutdowns throughout the economy. But um, public policy was was enacted very quickly, and it was very well targeted, and it helped mitigate some of some of the uh, the dislocations. Um, the recession, the decline in economic activity that we saw that wiped out 22 million jobs really occurred from, um, from, from the, during the month of March and the first half of April. And since that time, uh, we've been recovering and we've recovered a little bit more than half the jobs uh, that have been lost since that time. And uh, on top of that, uh, the relief payments have really supported consumers and we've seen that consumer spending is actually higher today than it was pre-pandemic, particularly spending uh, for folks at the lower end of the income spectrum and spending on goods in general. It's largely spending on services that has been, been lagging. Uh, we've also seen that because of the continued dislocations in parts of the service sector that require a lot of customer contact, like travel and leisure, uh, restaurants, shopping, the administrative functions, uh, within healthcare and, and professional services, that um, that the the negative effects, the the uh, the effects of the, the recession and the effects of the shutdowns have fallen hardest on minorities and minority-owned businesses, and that's contributed to the unrest that we saw after the uh, after the, uh, the 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 horrible instance that we saw in in, uh, in, in involving uh, uh, police and certain individuals and. It was, uh, and, and that contributed to the, the unrest that we've seen. And with that, we've seen an acceleration in the out migration uh, from some of the larger globally connected uh, major metros in the US. New York being uh, probably seeing the greatest dislocation, but San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Seattle to a smaller degree. And, uh, and, and there's a big question as to how much of this shift is permanent. And I, I always, you know, it, it, it is uh, permanent shifts. Permanent means different things to different, different people. I do think that there are some longer lasting shifts that are taking place here. And um, whenever we're in a recession, it tends to accelerate trends that were already in place. <clears throat> and one of the trends that we were seeing prior to the recession is that the, the cost of living and, and really just the hassle factor of doing business in New York, San Francisco, LA, and Seattle, um, we're beginning to offset the, the benefits of having all those highly talented people together. And we were seeing a lot of businesses move not only administrative functions 
to secondary markets, but moving a lot of R&D functions to those secondary markets. And, and I, I, I think that the, the pandemic has accelerated that. And you can see that when you look at the housing data and you look at, at, at how much home sales have picked up and where home sales and home building are picking up. And most of that pickup has been in the secondary markets. If you were to look at the, the Case-Shiller home price indices, the national home price index is the broadest measure and it's up the most, the 20 cities up the second most and the 10 city, which is a narrow measure of home prices is up the least because uh, New York City and San Francisco and LA have greater weights in that smaller subset. And we haven't seen prices rise as much in those markets. And, and, and that reflects you know, the shifts that we, that we see underway. Um, in, in terms of, of, of how, how permanent that shift is, I, I think we're going to see an affordability migration that, that, um, that really has legs through holding throughout the entire decade. I, I really think that there's, it's not a permanent shift. Um, we hear a lot of people say New York's debt is never coming back. Um, that's, we've seen that before, but I do think that there's, um, that th there's going to be a, a longer lasting dislocation from New York because it's coming from both ends. We're seeing fewer young people move to New York. We're seeing fewer people, uh, and I should say New York, San Francisco, LA, uh, and fewer people move there from overseas as immigration has largely been shut off. And we're seeing an accelerated out migration. So the numbers are likely to be fairly staggering when we see uh, the net loss of population in those markets. And that's one of the reasons why even in this, this hot housing market, we're, we're barely seeing housing prices budge in those areas. Now we are seeing price, we are seeing strong demand in the outlying areas and the exurban areas of those areas. Um, let me go through just a couple of charts because I'm, I'm gonna keep us right on time and uh, don't wanna bump up against it's time constraints, <laughs> and you'll have time to look at these charts after I'm through with this. But I have the basic trends in, in, in COVID, and uh, you would like to think it's behind us. The biggest problem right now is in universities. That is that raises a lot of risk later this year. Uh, most universities are going to send the students home. or are going to end the semester uh, at Thanksgiving. That's typically the kickoff to the cold and flu season as people travel around the country and and get together with their families. And I think that's the next big risk for, a, for an uptick in COVID. In terms of our economic outlook, we're looking for close to 30% GDP growth in the third quarter, the quarter we just completed, about 7% growth in the fourth. If we don't get a second stimulus, I don't think that fourth quarter economic growth is at risk, but the start of 2021 may turn out to be much weaker. So I, I think there's still about a 50-50 chance that we're going to get a stimulus deal. Um, Trump is never, um, it's never pretty to watch him negotiate. Um, they are negotiating today. And, and so I do think that we will see, uh, see a stimulus bill that will, will come out. In terms of job growth, we've recovered about half the jobs that we lost. About two thirds of the jobs that haven't been recovered are at restaurants, bars, entertainment venues, other services, which includes things like hair salons, fitness studios, massage parlors, things of that sort, and, and administrative services, administrative positions at, at doctors and dentist offices and in professional services. Um, the trend in layoffs has been coming down, but it's not likely to come down all that much until we're seeing more widespread reopenings of these businesses. And I'm afraid that that requires consumer interaction which is not likely to come back until we have um, a full approval of a vaccine. And not only that, but full approval of a vaccine and a vaccine that is, uh, that is being distributed in a major way. And, and I think that's uh, at the earliest um, toward the middle of next year. So I, I think these, these high jobless claims numbers are gonna, going to be with us. We'll continue to chip away at those job losses, but we won't recover all the jobs that were lost in the recession until uh, probably early 2022. Um, as you can see here, we've recovered about half of the job losses, a little bit more than half the job losses that we had. And, um, and, and 
the the uh, rate of improvement is slowing month after month, and it'll continue to slow when we get the October numbers. I, I really don't want to go through all, all of these charts. There's a couple of others that I was going to point to. This is daily asking rent data for some selected metropolitan areas. And San Francisco really blows the scale here. I mean, they're not the only one that are seeing declines, but, they, but they've certainly seen the greatest declines. And part of that is because rents there were so high prior to the pandemic. We're seeing the same things in other dense, globally connected cities. And I, I left one out, San Francisco and, and LA, you know, well-known. Miami is actually, uh, I believe, the third densest city in the United States. And of course, it's very globally connected. And so we are seeing uh, quite a, we're, we're seeing that rents are, are really softening there. All of these markets also had a, a lot of supply. On the plus side, Charlotte and Dallas and Nashville, although to a lesser extent, have been uh, notable bright spots. We've seen a number of businesses and a number of people move to those states in accelerated migration. The last chart that I was going to show you is some data from LinkedIn. And I think the LinkedIn data provides a very good sense of how many workers are moving within the United States. And it, it reinforces some of what we've seen in the, the prior chart in that uh, Austin, Charlotte, Tampa, Seattle, Denver, Raleigh, Phoenix, um, Boise's not on here, but they would be another one. Salt Lake City would be another one. They are really benefiting. They're seeing an accelerated in-migration as folks are seeking more affordable housing and more living space. So that's a very quick update. I've also got charts on the global economy in there that you can look to. And uh, I'm gonna stick around and, and, and be available for some questions. Thank you. You're on mute. There we go. Um, double on mute on, on my system here. All right. Um, that's a lot of information you're covering in a, a short period of time. And again, the audience will get a copy of these slides post event. Um, I want to get a couple of questions coming in here from the audience. And Stephen, uh, Krein, if we can have you come back on your video and audio as well, Stephen. Yeah, thanks for John rejoining us. A couple of questions here from the audience. Uh, is there any data on the number of jobs lost in the mobility industry uh, due to President Trump's <laughs> recent decision to stop issuing L? H-1B and J-1 visas? I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any data at my fingertips on that. I don't know whether, I don't know whether Mark does, but uh, maybe I'll just give you a quick editorial is that um, that has really been of benefit to the Canadian uh, economy that, that we're able to attract those skills. And, um, you know, our government has not been shy about saying that. Um, but I don't have I don't have any specific uh, numbers. I'm sure we can provide those uh, those Scott at some point. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would say that the uh, that it's that it's meaningful, uh, but I don't think that we can I don't think we can isolate that from the data. Um, unfortunately, when you get uh, to get industry data and and industry data that's to a specific geography. Um, there's there's some pretty long lags to get the reliable data. Much of what we have today is actually uh, for that that hard data is actually pre-pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions uh, to just kind of uh, help our audience out here to both of you. Uh, and then one recommendation: this whole session is about strategy, right? For 2021, even even going forward from today and into 2021. Uh, Stephen, the question for you would be, what is the one thing they need to be looking at from a talent mobility strategy? What is the top line thing they should be looking at in terms of uh, any potential areas they need to pivot to or major reactions uh, they need to make, major plans they need to make? And then for you, Mark, uh, same question, except from a financial standpoint, what is the one thing you'd like to see them build, blend into their strategy as they look at 2021 in light of what you just shared with us? I know it's tough to pinpoint one, but if you can give us one prescription there each, that'd be great. Well, from from the talent from the talent mobility perspective, Scott, I think um, mobility has often been seen as transactional. So, how do I move Scott and his family to you know from point A to point B? Um, if if companies are serious about trying to attract and and deploy the best talent, 
they have to change that thinking. They have to make sure that mobility is 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 part of the business strategy that they're choosing the right people they're making sure that they're getting the right people in the right place at the right time it it it's it sounds fairly simple but with the complexities around um family structure today the cost of housing immigration compliance it's not that simple and so there are many facets of it that have to be considered um so from a strategic perspective it really needs to come down from the C-suite that says, you know, this is a part of our game plan. If we want to play in, the, in, 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 in global markets, we need people that have got global savvy. Even if um, you don't have a multinational, even if you're not a, a multinational organization, we've got people coming from so many different backgrounds into our, our countries. It doesn't matter where we are, the UK, Australia, Canada, the US, um, we need people that can collaborate across uh, different uh, backgrounds, across different uh, uh, nations, you know, national upbringing and so on, that, that can really work with, with groups of people. So in my mind, global savvy is, is going to be the, the important factor for the future. And so I think that companies, you know, as they're looking at their talent um, attraction and their retention, and deployment of that human capital, that you need to use it strategically because it is in short supply. Now, that's such a great comment. And again, it goes back to some, something we've talked about before in the past and that global mindset, having the talent that's on board that really sees, has that peripheral vision, uh, thinks holistically um, and can really think ahead that way. So again, that's a great, great piece of advice, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Mark, what about your perspective from a financial standpoint? What, where do we need to focus really? Um, well, I, I think I think you have to realize that the 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 hurdle for relocating is now much less than it was before, and that and that people are are working remotely now, and they uh, and, and many of them are in places that they want to be, and they've gotten a chance to see how that works, and so I I, I think that I, we, we believe we just put out a report today that talks about how. It, after we get past the pandemic, we believe that most office work will continue to be done in the office because that's really the only way you can create and maintain a corporate culture. Mm. But I think that for specific skill sets, we are going to see that that uh, that companies are going to have an added reason to uh, to to uh, to move operations. And what we were seeing before with R and D uh, and and some of the more creative uh, endeavors. Uh, which historically have been have been in, in the very large globally connected metro areas, I, I think we're we're going to see that a lot of those are going to be moving to secondary cities where people have a better lifestyle, hmm. and, uh, and and we'll have to come up with solutions as to how we can how we can uh, relocate people and relocate business operations to some of those areas and create either satellite offices or in many cases um, entire businesses are relocating to these markets. Yeah, that's such a great comment. I think for all of us going into this original uh, crisis, we thought this might be temporary. Uh, this might not represent a structural change, but in fact, that is in fact what's happening and people are happy to do it. Uh, they, they're starting to enjoy this virtual and hybrid environment. So that's a great One comment. of the things that in terms of, of, of how permanent this may be that we're beginning to hear more and more is that people are looking back at the number of of viruses that we have seen. And, 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 you know, maybe it was that we just got lucky with H1N1 and that it didn't turn out to be as bad as it was. We didn't get hit with the bird flu. We didn't get hit with a bull in a big way. Going forward, we may not be as lucky. And, and this globally connected world we're in isn't going to be rolled back. And so the, the, the risk to global supply chains and to key personnel are, are, are likely to be greater in the future than what we thought in the past. And so I, I think businesses are going to have to set up a, a more resilient framework so that, 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 that uh, mitigates some of those risks. No, that's a great comment. And again, I uh, really want to thank both of you for, for coming in today. Uh, it, great perspectives, interesting perspectives, uh, and helping us reset. In fact, I'll just tag onto what you just said, Mark. You know, the Spanish, the widely misnamed Spanish flu of 1918, 
uh, people let that pass by. They just let it um, integrate to society, but we're not seeing that happen with COVID. So it is causing these structural design changes. And from Stephen's perspective, the mobility changes that may be permanent. So again, I want to thank both of you for joining us. Stick around if you can, because we'll bring you back up toward the end of the session. Thanks again. Thank you. Um, I want to move on now, um, bring on our production director, Jason, for just a couple of quick minutes. Um, Jason, uh, we've now been doing these virtual summits since March 20, and we've done several, almost 100 of them. Um, Mark, both Mark and Stephen just exhibited uh, great examples of how leaders should prepare concise, scripted comments to their audience, both internally and externally. Can you just make a quick, couple of quick comments on that before we um, bring up David? Yeah, with EMP, we've worked really hard to make sure that everyone follows a good system for communication. Uh, our events have really good engagement, but if you've been on, and I know you have been on other events, you've noticed that, or maybe even your own you know, Zoom or virtual events, meetings, whatnot, that it's hard to keep people engaged. And so for clear communication, it's really important to have a good scripting formula. And this works whether you're virtual or not. So learning this now will actually make your in-person events better when we get back to that, and hopefully it's sooner than later. Um, and, but it's also important to know that good scripting formulas makes everyone a better speaker. So if you're a good speaker now, or, or even a great speaker now, you'll be even better by following some of these simple tips. So I don't have a lot of time to share with you, but I want to share this one thing that you can start using today when you're communicating with other people, again, whether it be in a meeting or an event like this. Start by illustrating what you want to tell them. So you can do that by telling them a story. I opened the beginning of this segment by telling you a little bit, uh, you know, giving you an illustration. Then you need to explain what you want them to know. And then finally, tell them how that applies to their lives. How, how, how do they implement that? And this will be a good way to start to, to help people engage with you better uh, in uh, online and offline. Uh, if you'd like to explore this idea more, we have an event coming up on the 15th. This is a true master class. We're gonna give you the five secrets to virtual events, everything from pre-planning to promotion, choosing the right platform for your event and then how to follow up afterwards. And if you're interested in that, there'll be an email that goes out after the event and we'll put a link in the chat as well. Good stuff. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for those tips. Uh, let's, uh, let's move on now to David Altman. And uh, David is Chief Compliance Officer of NEO. Uh, David is one of Relocation Industries' foremost tax resources, terrific speaker, and he brings his strength and expertise uh, to the table today. Uh, again, you've got his full bio there, but we're delighted to have you, David, to come and share with us some of the forecast around tax and tax implications with us, a very critical part of this. By the way, keep your Q&A coming in. We will get to all these questions before the end. David, welcome. We still uh, may have to unmute there, David. There we go. Okay, well, I think we're unmuted. I'll, I'll attempt to share my screen. And, and right now, this screen, it really says it all. When we talk about taxes and relocation, the dollars hit the W-2. It's so important for everyone to understand, aside from the home sale costs, and again, one of the best reasons to use a third-party relocation company, some people refer to them as RMCs, is any dollars spent with a relocation management company to help sell the old home, those dollars do not appear on the W-2. Aside from that, everything else goes on the W-2, uh, the household goods expenses, the final move expenses, temporary living expenses, house hunting, closing costs on the new home always hit the W-2, miscellaneous allowances. According to the Employee Relocation Council, the average cost to move someone these days is about $100,000. I mean, it is huge, huge dollars. This is an example. I choose the modest example of only about 68000 But the reality is this transferee who makes well under $150,000 a year because their company relocated them, now their W-2 says over $200,000. Again, just adding the $68,000 to their W-2. So my goal, my takeaway for everybody is 
understand these dollars hit the W-2. And on more expensive moves, so many are a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. This is moving employees into much higher tax brackets. They're losing lots and lots of credits that are out there and tax benefits, something to be aware of. In fact, I'll close with on this slide, one of the hottest things, and, and I like that term, a next practice. It, it's really, it is a best practice, but it's also a next practice, is more and more companies are paying for a pre-move tax consultation. On most international moves, it's standard, but now it's becoming more and more common on domestic moves because the tax issues are just so complicated. Now moving on to our next slide, and I will attempt to get us to that next slide. Here's a copy of the stimulus check, and we've talked a lot about that this morning um, with Mark and, and others. So many employees, if you're single, the magic numbers on this slide, if you're single and you make between seventy-five dollars and $100,000, you got one of these checks. If you're married and basically make between one hundred fifty dollars and $198,000, you got one of these checks in the mail. And when I say a check, I'm just using that as an example. So many people got a direct deposit, an EFT, an ACH, whatever. These dollars hit the W-2. But think about what I just said on the last screen. If the company added 50, 60, $100,000 to your W-2, the chances are your income is now exceeded some of these new thresholds, so you no longer were able to get one of these checks or ACHs. These are huge, huge issues. If you are a company listening in, if you're a relocation management company listening in, there are so many tools in the marketplace that can analyze, was it the taxable relocation dollars that were added to the employee's W-2 or 1040 maybe last year that forced them to lose the ability to get a, a stimulus check? Very, very big issue. Again, most relocation management companies have the solution to this issue. It is a big, big issue this year and definitely as we move into next year also. This slide here, I cannot emphasize the parts in yellow highlighted even more. When we talk about Arkansas, California, Hawaii, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, these seven states still allow you to deduct your household goods. So many moving van bills are thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. Well, I started the presentation off saying most of these items are now taxable. The good news is if you're moving employees into any one of these seven states, you can save thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on gross ups by not grossing up for moving expenses. And again, when I'm saying moving expenses, it's the household goods, it's the final move in these seven states. Once again, contact your relocation management company who's ever calculating your gross ups. It's critical that they don't gross up expenses in these seven states. So many gross up dollars can be saved in these seven states. COVID-19, what are some of the tax impacts? It, it, they're huge. Number one, we talk about virtual presence and actual presence. Just so everyone knows, and I won't be like on the debate last night, uh, both sides didn't answer questions directly. I will answer this very, very directly. <laughs> virtual presence is not taxable. It's not taxable. So if you are virtually present in a location because you're on a phone or a WebEx or some sort of meeting like this, it's not taxable. But actual presence is taxable. So, for example, so many companies have employees who are not actually working in the old-fashioned office location, but they're actually working in another state. Even if that company doesn't have nexus in that state, and nexus is just a fancy word for presence, you know, actual tax presence in a state. So even though a company may have no nexus in that state, if just one employee is actually physically working in that state, they must pay taxes. You've got to do a gross up on that employee. That employee has to do a tax return in the state they are actually working in. Once again, this is why that pre-move tax consultation is so important today, more so than ever before. So the takeaway again on this slide is actual presence is taxable in whatever state you work in, even if your company has no physical presence or the tax term is no nexus in those states. 
critical temporary assignments, domestic temporary assignments, hot, hot, hot issues. I see, my, my guess is in the future, there will be more and more employees going on temporary assignments than ever before. And here's the good news slash the bad news. The good news is the expenses the company reimburses that employee for being on that temporary assignment. And a temporary assignment is defined as basically anything under a year. So all of their housing costs, all of their food, their transportation, et cetera, et cetera, not taxable, fantastic. However, the income the employee earns working temporarily, in other words, their salary, their paychecks, their bonuses, whatever money they make working on this temporary assignment in whatever part of the United States or any one of the other couple hundred countries around the world, those are taxable. Once again, the pre-move tax consultation advises the employee while the company doesn't need to gross you up for your expenses because your expenses are not taxable, the company may need to gross you up for your salary because if you're in a temporary assignment in a state that has a higher taxes, for example, let's say the company sends you to California, one of the highest tax states in our entire country, and you have to work there for seven or eight months, the average employee will owe an extra five or $10,000 in state tax, and they'll have to do a California tax return. You've got an employee that's worked in Texas all their life. They've never done a state tax return in their life. They now go on a seven-month assignment to the state of California. They must file a California state tax return. Once again, that pre-move tax consultation will give the employee the heads up, and then it's up to the company to decide, do you want to gross up their salary to cover that extra five or ten grand of state taxes now being caused by the state of California because they're on that temporary assignment? Disaster relief payments. I like to say the candy store is now open, <laughs> which is great. What that means is because our pandemic was declared a, a natural disaster, a federal disaster, et cetera, et cetera, so many costs associated with employees maybe having to move or go on a temporary assignment sooner or later, quicker or earlier, having to take a different flight back, having to stay a few extra months in a location they never expected to. Those expenses, because you can say they're COVID related, they are not taxable. They don't need to be grossed up. Work with your relocation management companies. Most every RMC today has a special team dedicated to specially tax coding these expenses that are COVID related because once again, they don't have to go on your W-2. They're not taxable. You don't have to do gross ups. Really, really good news. And this slide just gives you some examples of some of those expenses. Extra purchasing costs of a house, temporary living, food, lodging, et cetera, et cetera. So many expenses are now not subject to taxation because, you know, the pandemic was declared a disaster. And I'll end on my last slide. This booklet literally has been used by hundreds of thousands of employees in years past. It's a simple book booklet. I know this is a virtual presentation, but you can get the handout. You can click on it. It will explain to every transferee from the transferee level what their tax obligations are because they relocated or were on a temporary assignment in the middle of a pandemic. And the best part about this booklet is there's also a special phone number, a hotline, and an email where any employee can call or email and get any one of their tax questions answered, all again for the cost of the booklet, which is literally just you know pennies. So definitely it's a resource possibly available to you. Hundreds of thousands of other people who have moved and gone on assignment have taken advantage of this. Thank you once, once again for the opportunity, David. Scott, for sharing those uh, messages. David, thanks so much. A lot of good information. Uh, for those of you in the audience, uh, we will be sending a package with these presentations post-event. Uh, David, stick around. We'll probably have some questions toward the end here. Thanks much. All right. Let's talk technology transformation with Iram Karbari uh, of Cardus and uh, uh, recent uh, new position as Vice President of Technology Transformation at Curtis. Uh, Irma has a tremendous background in uh, technology, digital transformation, agile development, enterprise architecture, risk management, release and change management. Um, so Irma, I wanted to, really looking forward to your talk about this whole technology transformation, the move to digitization and the criticality of it. I think the numbers for McKinsey were that organizations, 73% of organizations were gonna spend more 
in this space in 2021 than they were uh, in 2019, 2020 combined. So look forward to your comments. Welcome. I think we're getting some uh, audio there. No, nope, still got an audio issue there. Remember? Let's see. How about now? Good. All good. good. Thanks much. All right. Sorry about that. Technology, right? <laughs> Um, um, thanks. This is a really good conversation. I'm learning a lot of things from, from other panelists. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, yeah, you are right. Uh, there, are, uh, there are amazing amount of changes happening, right? And, and to be very honest, eight to 10 minutes um, is not enough to define or discuss technology or digital transformation. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a very complex facade. Uh, uh, but we as a professional or technology professional facing this exciting time uh, is due to rapid adoption and innovation and usage of technology. I mean, COVID is probably one of the examples, but if you think last uh, five to 10 years, the amount of technology a normal consumer or a customer is using is tremendously high. And because of this rapid usage of technology, uh, organizations' engagement with their clients and customers is changing very fast. The, the engagement and experience of a client and customer is, is, is almost disrupted. Um, it, it's changing so fast that some organization may not be able to adopt the pace. Um, in, in my, uh, I have about five to seven years of experience in, in transformation. And in, in my experience, I, Think I, I categorize organizations in, in, in three categories, right? One is uh, that which are adopting technology. Um, and they're rapidly investing and implementing technologies, almost like following those shiny objects, buzz created technology, right? I mean, some of the names I'm sure you guys know, um, AI and data analytics and, 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 and automation and things like that. Um, in, in, in hope that uh, they're going to gain momentum and leap in technology step, right? I, I sometimes call them bus killers. Um, then there are other organizations uh, who are taking their existing processes uh, and their existing customer journeys and then digitizing them, right? It, these are the worst thing to do. You take these existing processes and digitize them. Um, and then also on top of it, calling it digital transformation. And then, then the last one, in my opinion, is digital visionaries, right? Organization who have changed the operating model of customer engagement. Uh, they have changed the, how they interact with the customer or customer interact with them using technology platforms like uh, Airbnbs of the world, Ubers of the world, uh, and this, as we all know, these organizations are winning. They, they are disrupting every possible aspect of their business and probably their industry. So, so the question is, if, if these are the three different kinds of organizations who we experience or we see, the question is then what is digital transformation, right? I believe it's a journey of strategic, holistic organizational change. It starts with fearless culture of innovation and fail fast attitude, which means having the right leadership with right mindset to create, a, create and cultivate curious, high performing teams uh, through deliberate business strategies, training and technologies, right? This is, this is digital transformation. Um, and, and I hope you have noticed that uh, in my definition, uh, there is no digital. Uh, and to lead digital transformation, the first thing you need to do is figure out business strategies and goals. Not that wants and needs, rather transformation must be guided by a broader business strategies. It's possible that transformation is forced upon you and then it's possible that uh, it is the nature of a business you are in or time you are in, 
COVID being one, but organization needs to have a criteria that needs to follow goals and objectives that takes organization to a success path. If you follow your business strategies and then every digital transformation will look different. Um, we'll have a different journeys and different achievements. The second thing I would keep in leading transformation is customer is first. Transformation or not transformation, customer is always first. Business needs to define customer experience and journey the way their customer is desired. It should be outside in. You should to check from customer's point of view how we should conduct business with them. It should be iterative. And if you don't know what your customer or client wants, then that'd be a losing battle faster than you think. Our goal should be improve your customer intimacy and then satisfaction. I also always talk about uh, we all need to invest in our people, process, and technology. I mean, classic trifecta. Organization that is serious about transformation and disruption needs to invest in people, process, and empower them with technology. People and process can help you define and probably in understanding improvements needed for your business. Fundamentally, it's because most technology provides possibilities of efficiency gain. But if people lack the right mindset, the, the, the change and the current organizational practice, uh, and, and if the practices are flawed, digital transformation will actually will simply magnify those flaws. So invest in, in people, invest in processes you have, and then empower uh, those with the technology. In, in, in many scenarios, and, and I uh, believe that those are good, introduce startup-like culture in your organization, right? Silicon Valley startups are known for their agile decision-making, uh, rapid prototyping. The process of digital transformation is inherently uncertain. Uh, changes needs to be made provisionally and, and, and adjusted probably very frequently. Decisions need to be made very quickly. So we need, we need to empower our people to make business processes nimble and efficient. So in, in, in nutshell, right, uh, as I said, eight to 10 minutes to define what digital transformation and what we must be doing uh, next year, year I, I always talk about these four items. Business strategies first, your customers are first. You need to invest in your people and process, empower them with technology, and then make sure your mindset is right. In summary, digital transformation work for those organizations where their leaders went back to fundamentals. They focus on business, strategy, they focus on change of a culture, they focus on the mindset of their members. That's a great Before you decide what digital tools are, make sure that you have business strategy uh, defined and not it's not other way around where technology comes first. So again, thank you, as I said, eight minutes is really short. <laughs> I guess. Uh, this was good. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of boiling the ocean in eight minutes, but you did a terrific job. This again could be a session all to itself, and we will be having sure. a session on this exclusively. But thanks for giving us a, a top line of that. You're so right to be considering those four areas when you're looking at it, and I think that tees it up perfectly for the rest of the dialogue here. Imro, if you'll stick around, and again, thank you for Cardas and supporting us in this event. It's great seeing you, and uh, congratulations on the new uh, position. Thank so. You. Uh, Jason, I've got some Q&A here, but uh, let's, uh, let's keep moving forward because I do want to get to uh, all the audience questions here after the, um, after the next couple of panels here. I want to bring up uh, our dynamic duo to have a conversation about uh, some of these next practice strategies. And these are two long-term friends of Executive Next Practice Institute. Susan serves on our program team in New York. Uh, she is CEO of uh, 
founder and managing principal of SRG Advisory. She is an expert in terms of helping companies align their vision and values with a changing world. She is an excellent expert in the mobility world. Many of you know her. Uh, she also works closely with uh, WERC and has, in fact, received WERC's Meritorious Service Award. So we welcome Susan. And uh, Bill Edwards, also a long-term friend of the family. Uh, Bill is uh, uh, CEO of Edwards Global Services. Uh, over 46 years, has worked in international operations, development, executive, and entrepreneurial endeavors. He's lived in China, uh, the Czech Republic, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Iran, and Turkey. Um, he has twice, twice received the U.S. Presidential Award for Export Excellence. He, this is a true expert. So we've got the two experts here to kind of start to wrap this together for us in terms of how we reframe our global uh, organizations. Welcome, Susan and Bill. Thank you so much, Scott, and good morning and good afternoon uh, to everyone. Delighted to be um, part of the duo with Bill Edwards. Bill and I see five mega trends emerging from a post-pandemic world. We've based our view on several sources. First, the World Economic Forum's recent initiative entitled The Great Reset, and Scott mentioned a McKinsey survey. Uh, we're also um, delved into the September survey of what over 800 global leaders envision for the post-pandemic world. And last, we've based our views on our own experience, a combined 75 years of business experience. In our views, leaders should consider these trends as they look to rethink and reimagine their organization. So we've distilled these five trends as one, people and culture, two, empathy, and uh, Stephen Krein talked about that earlier, three, innovation, and thank you, Imran, four, adaptability, and five, agility and a passion for learning. So in the interest of time, we're going to focus on people and culture, empathy and innovation, and if time permits, we'll touch on the other trends. Over to you, Bill. You have to unmute. Uh, thank you, Susan. My perspective is one of an international operating executive. Uh, today, I oversee a team that covers 43 countries. Previously, as, uh, as Scott mentioned, I lived in uh, six other countries and have done 11, uh, 11 C container moves. So I've been one of those expats that got sent around and had to watch out with their special W-2 look, look like, I remember that. Successful international companies today focus on three audiences. They're a multi-generational, multicultural staff, uh, their managers, their international partners, and then their global customers. I think an excellent example of this during COVID was Dairy Queen, who operates almost 7,000 units in 30 countries. During the crisis, they communicated daily in detail what they were doing across the world to address cleanliness, shutdown, supply chain, eventually reopening to all three audiences, their worldwide employees, their worldwide partners and licensees, and of their customers in every country. The customers they needed to communicate with so that people would feel comfortable coming back to their units, knowing that, that COVID was being taken care of properly. The result for this brand has been a stronger bond than ever before across the brand universe. Susan? Great, thank you, Bill. So it's never been more important for companies to recognize the need to co collaborate, work, working in a very integrated fashion with governments, communities, regulators, and NGOs, acting on the growing value and revenue that is achieved by finding innovative solutions to social, economic and environmental changes. There's now an increased need to have a social impact and a social contract strategy as an integrated part of a company's business objectives. Additionally, creating a culture for a great employee and customer experience remains a top priority for many companies. This means new programs will supplement existing offerings. For example, more companies can leverage their global mobility programs to attract highly skilled candidates for an enriched 
personal and professional experience. Remote work options and remote assignments are changing the definition of the mobility industry. McKinsey also cites the increased reliance on temporary or gig workers. The paradigm of what it means to move talent has changed. Today, the focus is on getting worker, work to workers rather than workers to work. I think the second trend we're gonna deal with is empathy in the mobile uh, marketplace or workforce uh, with a refreshed focus on, um, on duty of care, I think is the best way to put it. Because I found that successful global companies carefully consider the impact that moves are going to have on the employees and their families. This includes, as Susan has told me, wellness, health, schooling, productivity, cultural understanding when you get to a new place, adjustment in the marketplace, as well as the overall financial needs of a family in the new location. It also means considering how best to integrate the employee back into the home country at the end of the assignment. This is something that's been forgotten in the past. In my family's six overseas assignments in the 70s, 80s, and 90s for a Fortune 50 company, these concerns were not really at the top of priorities for the company. Uh, and as a result of that, we had some challenges. I'll leave it at that. Today, talent would leave the companies if these now considered basic requirements are not addressed to the satisfaction of the employee and their families. Great, thank you so much, Bill. So uh, here, just a brief mention that it does not fully account for the importance of attracting, developing, and retaining a diverse and inclusive workforce. Stephen Krein from CRC mentioned this this morning. Studies have shown that companies with a diverse workforce, and most notably at leadership levels, are more productive and more profitable. Over to you, Bill. Oh, yes, here on, excuse me, the third friend, <laughs> the third trend that we wanted to talk about was innovation. The global shortage for skilled talent will likely drive overall innovation in talent management and ta talent acquisition. Innovation, integrating huge amounts of data and analytics has been catalyzed by speed to market demands. Innovation is now key to how a company does business in, in an increasingly complex world. As mentioned earlier, McKenzie's recent study cites that the adoption and integration of autom automation, digitization, and analytics has accelerated since the pandemics. Two survey sightings that you'll find interesting is close to 70% of companies surveyed have accelerated automation and AI, and 85% of companies have accelerated digitization. This uptick is due in part to the enhanced focus on hygiene as well as cost pressures. Some examples, American Eagle Outfitters has recently used robots to sort their merchandise in warehouses to meet the increased demand of online purchases. IBM saw a large increase in customers and demand for AI-driven Watson Assistant. We're all aware and may also be supporting the surge in Amazon's business, here again, supporting contactless purchases. I have two examples of companies that I'm very familiar with who innovated during the COVID crisis. One is Chili's restaurant brand, which many of you may know, and another is a fitness brand called Snap Fitness. Chili operates in about 32 countries, Snap in about 20. They took their pre-COVID business and operating models apart, literally, and found ways to improve operating efficiency, unit size, unit investment, and eventually what will happen is they've improved their unit EBITDAs bottom lines with no new investment for their international operations. Susan? So just to quickly summarize, if we have another moment, uh, Scott. No, we'll need to, got the 30 seconds, you're good. <laughs> okay, so the key themes from these mega trends are workforce mobility is closer to talent 
acquisition and talent development than ever before. Change is the new const constant, as we all discussed. HR and mobility are positioned to play a key role in leading change. It's important to collaborate, and everyone's mentioned this today, across organizations and industries to shape positive, meaningful employee and customer experiences. Co-creating with the business and forming ecosystems and stakeholder integration with the organization and with the supply chain to optimize solutions based on needs and objectives and simplifying communication and harvesting insights from massive amounts of data in a changing and dynamic workforce. Lastly, looking inward and outward facing, leveraging those ecosystems that are brimming with talent, fostering relationships and collaborating as everyone said here today to deliver results, nurturing and moving talent when and where it's needed to meet talent demands and drive revenue growth. That's Scott? great. Okay, we'll have to make that the final word. That's a great summary for us and leads us um, into uh, our panel discussion with, uh, with Robert, Sylvia, and our corporate panelists. Thank you again, uh, Bill and uh, Susan. That was a terrific uh, point and counterpoint. Uh, I want to bring up now our, our final panel. Uh, again, the audience has the full bios on each of these folks. Uh, Sylvia Ehrlich, of course, is our program lead for ENP in New York, a uh, well-known international mobility uh, expert. Uh, Robert Horsley, Executive Director of Fragment, our long-term partner, um, Chairman Emerson of uh, WERC, uh, Stephen McCary, uh, WP Director of Mobility, and Melissa Sudana, of course, Director of Global Mobility of American Express. Sylvia, I'm going to throw it right to you because I know you've got some great comments to go through here. Thank, thank you very much. I hope I've got a panel up. I don't see the panel up. Yeah, we're getting uh, I see live there. Okay, there we, there we go. I'm going to get out of the way and let uh, Melissa get in. Um, I think there's been some interesting discussions that have gone on up to now. Uh, what I like about our panel that we have to present to you today is, um, or again, depending on what time zone you're in, day, morning, noon, or uh, very late, uh, what we've got here is we, we have Steve McGarry, who works in an environment that is the creative, what I call the creative world, with a lot of create, creative mind focus. Melissa works in the world of finance, which is definitely more linear than the creative world. And Robert, who works with all types, including both these companies, which make it very interesting. All three are also extremely well-known and um, knowledge, acknowledged as top leaders in our world and in our field. Mark brought up the subject of uh, Volca. For those of you who don't know Volca, uh, and I don't want to say Volca, Volca, uh, it, it stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, which is truly, I think, uh, uh, that was done in 1987 by Warren Bienis and Bert Nannis, but it stands and it certainly holds today. I, I'd like to um, sort of wrap up what we've been hearing here and talk about some of how you've been adapting, what kind of open mind solutions you're using, how we can elevate the conversation with our companies, with our assignees, with, with uh, HR, from an HR perspective to begin with. How are we doing from compliance and talent strategies and how are we able to help with DNI, diversity and inclusion in today's world? Steve, I'm gonna divert back over to you and I'm gonna ask you, cause I know in your, with your creative community, they tried to get very creative with things that I know affect compliance and also can have an impact on your duty of care. And I'd love for you to be able to give us some examples and address that some I know, but I'd love for you to share them with the others. Well, uh, one, one of the things that happened right off the bat is that when we told everybody to work from home, um, they didn't, they took it very literally as far as they were going to what they considered their home location. Um, so we had a lot of people, not only within the United States, um, go in between states. We had a lot of people go from country to country. At one point in time, I had at one count about 10% of our um, population in the UK alone um, uh, working in 
80 different foreign countries other than the United Kingdom, um, which, of course, brings up personal taxation, corporate taxation, uh, corporate permanent establishment and uh, employment law issues um, for every single one of those locations. Um, and then, um, you know, we also have to look at the same situation as it comes to the United States. Um, we, WPP, we are not like Walmart where we have something in every single location in the United States. We are not physically present in every state. As such, we can't have people just picking up and moving themselves to any state and saying, I want to change my payroll of the state because number one, we don't have a presence in that state something David talked about earlier. And number two, it takes a lot to actually set up a payroll for somebody in that state. It's not just a matter of flipping the switch. Thirdly, which a lot of people didn't understand, if you have a job that is actually located in New York and you move yourself out, you very well may also be subject to resident taxes in New York City and New York State because it wasn't an employee, employer-sponsored move. It was an employee move that just they literally just packed up and left. Um, so we are we are now trying to work through all of those those not only personal um, taxation issues with our employees, also the corporate taxation issues with them, um, and as it is with uh, foreign individuals on the domestic side as well. When somebody decides to leave New York and they decide that they're going to work themselves in California. They are no longer working under the employment law of the state of New York. They are working under the employment law of the state of California. And quite honestly, we don't want that. Um, as anybody who has to deal with California employment law, you know it is very, very employee friendly. Um, and there are reasons why we have people contracted to offices. So, um, you know, what our plan is at this point in time is let everybody just kind of stay where they are for the short term. By the end of the year, get everybody back to where their contracted office is supposed to be, and then take a look at it on an individual basis next year, looking at all of the corporate personal um, um, compliance issues, as well as this Sylvia said the duty of care. How do their benefits follow them from state to state? Well, yeah. all of what you've both said, in particular you, Steve, get, gives me my favorite expression that I've had throughout this whole thing, which is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring you up. I bring Robert in. So, Robert, if you could just do a bit of real opening. You know, I, I love everything I've heard today. Uh, it reminds me just how... Uh, just how sharp our whole everybody in our industry really is at identifying what's going on. And I, you know, just to kind of think about it, what, what did we really hear today? Right. We heard you need to adapt. You need to embrace opportunity. You need to flex. Um, and you need to transform. So I was trying to think about how, 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 you know, I like to think macro to micro and how I develop strategies, but, so to kind of put that at a macro level, I've kind of put it in three buckets, elevate, scale, and modernize. So anything that, anything that I'm working on that we're doing needs to meet all three of those uh, criteria. It's really easy to say, and it's hard to do. So I tried to come up with some idea. So how do you do it? Well, first off, and I think others have said it, you need to digitize, right? Can't, you can't live in the modern world without digitizing. You need to standardize because you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to flex if you're not standard. Uh, you need to harmonize. You need to be ready in doing this. You need to be ready to do it with others. Um, you need to expand. You need to really look at what your core competencies are so you can you can you can grab those opportunities. Uh, and you need to really be able to articulate value. You know, I think I, I was just gonna give you two examples as Joshua kind of told us we should be thinking about. And, and they're fragment examples, right? Um, you may have noted uh, last week we announced we started and bought a technology company, an immigration technology company. And why is that? Well, I think our thinking was to, to really move at the speed that business moves today, you need to have all that agility that a technology firm would have not so much a professional services firm that where we're having to you know hold hold hands and always get it right. Well, a technology firm, is, as it was noted, you know moves fast, breaks things, and and adapts. So I that that's that's our theory, and our theory is you have to have that culture built in. You can't have cultures that collide. 
So, you know, as much as we've been in the forefront of all this, we thought, okay, this is time to really develop a, a technology company with a culture that can be fast and adaptive. The other thing what you've done, and this is an example in, in Silicon Valley, as a, as a matter of fact, we're embracing, you know, what, what some of those trends were of people moving, how they want to work, work, in, work at home, but also meet up with everybody they're meeting up with and, and remain in the culture of the area. So I, I don't think we've announced this publicly, but um, our Silicon Valley office, which just happened to have a lease that was running up uh, at the end of the year, we've, we've scaled back um, the size of that new office by about 60%. So it right. would be 60% smaller. Wow. What's that? I said hot off the press. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I think the cool part there is, right, it is saying and talking to all our people was, yes, we want to work more remotely and we can. We can have a better quality of life. But we also want to be able to come in when we want to come in. So that space is being outfitted much more to allow people to meet together when they're, when they're there very intentionally. Thank you. That's a, all of you have done a wonderful, uh, have provided a wonderful experience for everyone that is listening to us. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning, adapting open-minded solutions, elevating the conversation, compliance, re the remote mindset and talent strategies with diversity and inclusion as part of all of that. With that, I thank you all for listening and I thank you all for participating. You are such great leaders and all strength and all SCRPs as well. And, um, and so is Dave Altman now, congratulations to Dave. And I turn this back over to you, Scott. Sylvia, thank you, friend, your terrific panel, Robert, uh, Melissa, and Stephen. Uh, Jason, if you'll put up our closing slide. Uh, we did go over a couple over minutes, but I thought this was a very important conversation, and it leads into the next session of this, which is in January. So we'll see you in January for this global summit. In the meantime, there are a couple of events coming up. So what do you do from here out of today's session? Number one, there'll be a recording of the session that we'll be posting. Secondly, you'll get the slides from today's events. Thirdly, our suggestion to you is this may be the time you want to convene your team for a strategic offsite, virtual or hybrid, uh, and go through a blue ocean exercise. That is based on today's session, what can you eliminate, create, align yourself to, and change and modify your culture to support, and then move forward with those things that you can measure for impact. And then finally, Jason, we'll leave folks with this next uh, couple of weeks. We'll be talking about how to do those virtual retreats. Again, I want to thank all of our uh, esteemed panelists and speakers today. Uh, again, you've got their bios. We'll send you their contact information. And again, we'll look forward to seeing you at some of these upcoming events and the next one of these global summits again in January. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank Thanks you so much. Thanks again for everybody.